I want you to turn in your Bibles, please. 2 Corinthians 9. When you're turning there, I want to I just say something. Just You know, we have some, some folks here who, who demonstrate dedication in a lot of different ways. And, uh, I'm so grateful for the servant heart it's expressed in so many of you, by so many of you. I want to tell you something. This morning, uh, I got a phone call from Joshua, and he said, Our, the van's broken down. We can't get it started. And I was scrambling, and they didn't get here. He and Mary didn't get here until 10.15. They did not have the time to go over the set like they typically do and do checks with Michelle and things like that. But I'm so grateful for people who will, who will fight through adversity, not throw in the towel easily, and grateful for talent and gifts that can, uh, in a short notice, uh, lead us in worship. I thank the Lord for that kind of uh, skill. I don't have it, but I'm thankful to God for those who do. Second Corinthians 9. Remember now, we're looking at this overarching theme for a few weeks because of who he is. And you just saw a great summary video on that. Last week we said because of who he is, we, we pray. He is the Lord of the harvest. Today I want us to look at because of who he is, we give. We're going to be looking at this scripture, this, uh, this passage in 2 Corinthians 9, uh, verses 6 to 15, and some companion passages. And I want you to think along a couple of lines with me. Three, perhaps. One is that the scripture teaches very plainly about this subject of giving. Uh, secondly, we are in the season of collecting the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, uh, an opportunity to give over and above regular contributions. And the third, we're, we're in the season where we're going to adopt a budget. And uh, the budget finance team and the pastoral ministries team have been meeting about that. And it's a, it's a tough thing to meet about because we're having cuts in our budget in different places. So I want you to think, just let's, let's think spiritually together today. I want you to stand with me if you would and just follow along as I read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 15. By the way, doesn't the, doesn't the auditorium in the area look, look nice around the facility? Thank you so much for those of you who stayed to, to trim our facility and, uh, and give it that uh, special touch as we're in the Christmas season. Follow along as I read, beginning in verse 6. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things, at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it's written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surprising grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. This is what? It's the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. As we read it today, as we study it today and, and other passages like it, may the Lord help us to see the value, uh, the joy, and the blessedness that comes from being faithful stewards of all, every aspect of our lives, uh, specifically as it pertains to giving not only financially, but giving of ourselves to the work of the Lord. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, you saw the little video which we just showed, and it, it just reminded us that since 1845, when the Southern Baptist Convention was founded in Augusta, Georgia, uh, and though, though the, 
the foundings of it uh, may be clouded somewhat because it was uh, at one point it was all American Baptists joined together and the South of course had to struggle with the slave issue and, and so the Baptists in the North said anyone any church that has members that that are holding slaves is not allowed to send missionaries our brothers in the South realized the slave issue was tough I mean it was there was no easy answer to it you couldn't just automatically release them when they'd not been taught to care for themselves and so there was a, there was a real compassionate movement among Southern Baptists Baptists in the South to to work through the slave issue in a, in a righteous way but they felt like that was a that was a wrong path for our Northern Baptist brethren to take not to allow our churches to uh, send missionaries and so that's when the, they broke away because of differences over the slave issue how to handle it but primarily because they wanted the opportunity to send missionaries to the foreign fields so in 1845 in Augusta Georgia a group of uh, delegates as they called them at the time met there to discuss forming a new convention it became the Southern Baptist Convention it was it was formed and driven by a missionary zeal okay And since then, we've been emphasizing missions. It is, someone said that, that the mission imperative is the heartbeat of Southern Baptists, and that's true, it has been for, for decades. So we've always talked about giving for the missionary cause. And I want to just show you a couple of slides real quickly before we get into our text that show, first of all, the idea of giving to send missionaries. That first slide shows you that there are two ways that a church can give to Southern Baptist causes to send missionaries. The first one is that we, we give through the cooperative program. So that means that a certain percentage of our giving here, uh, as if you give a nickel, uh, then you participate in that. You give a dollar, you participate in that. A certain percentage goes to the Baptist General Convention of Oklahoma, which takes a percentage of that and sends the remainder on to uh, the, the SBC Executive Committee in Nashville, and then you can see that that that, that supports uh, various SBC entities, uh, North American Mission Board, our seminaries, Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, so on and so forth. Another way we give, and that's why we're emphasizing in the season, is the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Notice that that offering goes 100 percent to uh, to the International Mission Board budget. Uh, Fifty-eight percent of their budget is supported by this Lottie Moon Christmas offering and it sends missionaries into all the world. I told you last week for the first time in recent history we're facing a challenge of having to bring missionaries off the field because of a, of a lack of financial resources to get their financial house in order. I'll show you another slide real quickly and it shows you what this more, more pointedly about giving through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering does. The, the top thing says that thousands of people in churches give through the, this offering 100% of it is used to send and support missionaries. Uh, we currently have 4,700. In one year, notice uh, that 1.75 million people, one and three quarters million people, had the gospel shared with them through these efforts. Uh, training 21,000 uh, indigenous people to plant churches. Uh, helping to start 14,000 churches internationally. Uh, doing things like, in addition like rescuing slaves, sex slaves. You know, slavery still goes on in the world. We, uh, we spend a lot of time in our country, folks do wanting to bash our past because we used to have slaves. There's still plenty of places in the world that have slaves currently. And uh, they're helping to try to stamp that out. Uh, feed orphans uh, and care for the needy. But here's the, here's the reality. Billions remain lost. And so we give. Joshua's already stated very plainly, I think very well, how the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, uh, reflects a giving heart. The Father gives the Son to be the Savior of sinners. The Son gives Himself. He gives His life a ransom for many. The Father and Son together give the Spirit to come and and convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Our God's heart beat is a giving God. I want us to see just five things uh, for the next few minutes in this passage about this matter of because of who he is, because of the character of God, we as his people, we as his disciples respond to his character by giving. 
First of all, the principle of sowing and reaping. We're going to look at that in verse 6. Secondly, the standard of giving under grace. We'll look at that in verse 7. Third, giving based upon God's ability, verses 8 to 10. I don't, I don't think we take that into consideration like we ought. Fourth, the blessings that come to the giver, verses 11 to 14. Fifth, the whole example of giving the greatest gift of all, Jesus Christ. So first let's look at the principle of sowing and reaping. Verse 6, Paul says to this troubled church, the church at Corinth, remember, had a lot of problems. He says, here's the point. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully or, or, or generously will also reap generously. This is a principle. It's a principle of life. I've told you before when we've looked at this passage in different contexts that, that I had the opportunity to spend uh, nine years in the community of Clinton, Louisiana. Several of our members were farming types, working a farm, uh, running a dairy. And I can remember uh, going out with, with one of the men when, he was, when it was time to sow. He was sowing ryegrass. And he would cover his whole field, so much so that ryegrass would spill beyond his fences. He was sowing lavishly, promiscuously, if you please. And when all was done, he had sowed. I remember having conversations about, you know, I hope, I hope the rains come at the right time. Because he knew that he'd done what he could do. He is sowing, but he couldn't, he couldn't make the ryegrass come out of the ground. We'd also hope and pray that hail would not, a hailstorm would not come through because that would kill the ryegrass. We, and we'd seen all these things, by the way. And when a, when a bountiful harvest of ryegrass came up so that he could go in and cut it, uh, feed it to his, his animals, it was a great day. The harvest had come. But he knew if he, if he was stingy with his sowing that he could not expect a wide, broad scale of a crop of ryegrass. So it's a principle from life, and you can, you can apply it in a lot of different ways. I can tell you that the, the, to the point, <clears throat> the extent that you put in time in devotion to God, communing with Him, that your growth and grace will be tied to that. Do that sparsely or sparingly, experience little spiritual growth. It'd be just like if you don't eat, go without eating for a while, and you won't be healthy. So it's a, it's a universal principle of life, and Paul takes that and he applies that. He's talking, and if you read back up into, into chapter 9 and all the way back into chapter 8, he's talking about what he calls the gift. It's the, the collection. The entire time Paul was ministering in the book of Acts, the church of Jerusalem was struggling because they had experienced this explosion. They went from a band of 120 in the upper room to thousands on the day of Pentecost. And if you read Acts carefully, there was another explosion, thousands more. And then daily being added, scores and scores and scores. And the church formed in Jerusalem struggled continually. And Paul made a part of his ministry as he went around from place to place planting churches, saying to them, now I want you new followers of Jesus to be faithful to give. We need to support the saints in Jerusalem. He says to the Galatians, uh, sort of along the lines of this, of this principle of, of sowing and reaping, chapter 6, verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not going to be mocked. Whatever one sows, that he will also reap. So there he's speaking more broadly that if you sow evil, do not be surprised when you reap evil. If you sow righteousness, do not be surprised when you reap righteousness. And so there is this principle he leads off with because of who God is, we give, and we, we give knowing this, that, that if we try to settle in giving as little as we can, you know the question teenagers ask, well, how far can I go without stepping over the line? That's the wrong question. <laughs> how little can I give and be considered a giver? That's the wrong question. Sparing, sparingly, sowing produces a sparingly reaping. But bountifully or generously giving, sowing will reap bountiful or generous rewards and results. So keep that in your head and ask yourself the question, how, how do I sow? 
according to this passage. How do I sow? And how is it connected to what I'm experiencing in life? Second, the standard of giving under grace. Paul says here, each one must give as as decided in his heart. The word there is purposed. So it's it's what we call on-purpose giving, not accidental giving. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly, or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We read together Malachi 3, and you know down in verse 7 and following, uh, the Lord challenges their thinking. He says in verse 7, return to me and I'll return to you. But you say, how shall we return? In other words, what constitutes in the context here of being, having drifted away from God? And without telling them how to return, he asks another question. Will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. You say, well, how have we robbed you? In tithes and contributions. Hang on to that. Because you see, the standard of giving under grace is not the tithe. Someone has said, uh, and I think they've said it well, the tithe is the floor, not the ceiling. Old Testament folks tithed. This is particularly, this passage is talking about storehouse tithing. Bring, bring all the tithes into the treasury of, of the temple or the synagogue. By the way, if you read carefully through the Old Testament, you realize that there was, there was a time to tithe during this certain uh, celebration and tithe for this certain. And someone has suggested when you total up all the tithes that a truly orthodox Jew would be giving about 30% of his income. But here, here in Malachi, God is speaking about the, the tithe into the storehouse. Not for special occasions, but the general giving. And the tithe is a 10%. And I think the fellow's right who says that for, for the gospel, for those under grace, the tithe is the, is the floor. And I don't want you to be alarmed if you're not tithing. We're going to talk about that in a minute. See, the standard for giving under grace is purposeful giving. And it's a heart issue. You start in the heart. What he decides or purposes in his heart. It tells us how we're not to give. We're not to give reluctantly, say, well, you know, I guess I need to do this. I'm not sure I want to, but no, don't give that way. Or under compulsion, and please believe me, I want the first in the world to, to put you under, a, under some guilt manipulation. I do not want to do that. In fact, the scripture forbids that, not compulsion. I know of places, heard of places, there was a, there was a, uh, one of the men in our church in Clinton ran a finance company. And he would have, uh, he would tell about these poor uh, widow women who would come in and take out a loan because the pastor had scolded them about not, quote, giving their tithe. They would borrow money to do that. That's just, it's not right. Not under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. So Paul is telling us here that under grace... What ought to drive our hearts is joy. In fact, the word here, I've told you this before, if you look at it in the Greek, it's the word hilarion. Now, if you listen to that, you hear the word what? Hilarious. And I think, test myself, I test you, when was the last time when you got out your checkbook or got out the envelope, started to write a check or you got out the cash to put in the envelope, that it made you giggle? That's what it is here. That you giggled. You know, there's a passage in the Old Testament where David was commanded to collect the items to build the temple. David didn't get to build the temple, but he was in charge of collecting the items. His response to God was, God, who are we that you would let us get in on this and do this? That's the attitude. Here's the truth of the matter. God doesn't need our money any more than he needs our voice. You know, the Pharisees said to Jesus in that, when they were traveling into Jerusalem, riding on that colt with the palm branches being put on the floor, the, the road, and coats, they, and the, the religious leader said to Jesus, tell them to be quiet. Tell the rabble to be quiet. And he said, why? If they're silent, the rocks and hills will take up my name. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need us to speak for him, though he has commanded us to do that. He doesn't, need, he doesn't need our money to do his work, though he's commanded us to give. And so, 
as we respond to his clear teaching and command. What we ought to do is pray that we'll have this kind of heart. A purposeful heart. That we, that we, that we give on purpose. We don't give haphazard. I heard one fellow say years ago, he said, we're supposed to give according as the Lord has prospered. We're going to look at that verse in a minute. Not according as we have squandered. In other words, give what's left over uh, when all is said and done. We try to challenge ourselves and our family when Lottie Moon offering time comes around, which coincides with Christmas. Give, give as much to, through the Lottie Moon offering as you give in gifts. Because the gifts we give will wear out. But that gift of the Lottie Moon offering is a gift that keeps on giving and keeps on going and keeps on growing. So it's a purposeful thing. It's not reluctant. We don't have a bad attitude about it. And we don't, we're not doing it because we feel guilty. But we're giving because it tickles us to do so. God loves a cheerful giver. Now, that, that's my prayer. I pray that for myself, for all of us. Lord, may we never become weary of giving. It's a, you know, just like, just like every seven days, the Lord has a cycle and says, okay, time to rest from all your labors. And now come and rest in me and, and worship with the people of God. He's a God who operates in cycle and in order and in the and same way with, with giving. In fact, when they asked him in Malachi 3, how have we robbed you? He didn't just say in tithes. He said in tithes and offerings. In your giving. So we want to have a cheerful attitude and heart. Another verse I want you to look at is 1 Corinthians 16, 2, where at the end of, of the first letter to the Corinthians... Paul said, he's instructing them about this. How, on the first day of the week, that's the Lord's day, it's the day that the saints gathered, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper. Now that, that rendering of as he may prosper is, is, is better uh, as he has been prospered, as the Lord has prospered. And I think some of the versions read. It's not put something aside so that you may prosper. You put something aside because you stop and you consciously consider, how has the Lord prospered me? And that question is not answered simply looking at your checkbook or your checking account. That question is answered as you look around you. We have 10 grandchildren so far. Joe and Vicki, I think you all have 13 or, or almost 13 or, yeah, very close. Next week or two. Folks, that's the Lord prospering you. That's the blessing of the Lord. One of the promises in the Psalms that, that shows God's blessing is He will see His children's children. What about your health? Maybe you've gone through a health crisis and you're coming out of it. Maybe you've, you've been shielded from that. That's God's prospering you. You see, how do you, how do you measure the prospering of God in our lives? Well, you, here's where you start. You start by inhaling, and then you exhale. And you realize, I was able to, my lungs work because of the blessing of God upon my life. Store it up, lay aside. Purpose according and be conscious how God has prospered you. Now, if he hasn't prospered you, maybe you might want to ask for a refund. Happens every now and then. You read in the paper where some, some fellow went to some church where some pe preacher shot off his mouth, and I promise you, if, if you give X amount of dollars, you're going to see this, and it didn't happen. And so some fellow sues the church for false advertising. But if you stop and count the blessings, you know the song we sing, it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Third, I want you to look at giving based upon God's ability. I don't think we think of giving this way. It's just it's powerful. In fact, I'll tell you, I think what happens to some people, I might be speaking to somebody here, I don't know. The devil has lied to you, and here's his lie. Now look, you, can, you, you can't afford to give right now. But when you can afford to give, then you can start giving. Now, if you've bought that lie from the devil, let me tell you something. He's the God, little g, the God of God, and he'll see to it that there's always some obstacle in the way that you can't give. It's as silly as people saying, we can't afford to have a baby. Isn't it interesting when you find out you're going to have a baby? 
how that discussion goes by the wayside and you get ready to have a baby? Don't, don't buy the lie. Here's the truth from the scriptures. The devil says you cannot afford to give. The scripture says you cannot afford not to give. You can't afford not to give. The practical aspect of this is you just start somewhere. Start giving something. A dollar a week in an envelope placed in the collection plate will begin to build in you the discipline of these biblical principles of giving. But if you say, I'm going to wait till I have $10 to put in, it may not ever happen. Remember sowing and reaping? If you sow sparsely or sparingly, you reap sparsely and sparingly. But if you begin to sow little by little, and then you grow in that, and you begin to see how God more than, more than provides your needs, then you, you get more bold and more bold and more bold. And you talk to people who have the gift of giving. They're some of the happiest people you'll ever meet. Now look at this giving based on God's ability. Verses 8 to 10. This is, this is huge. And God is able. So, Pastor, well, we're not able. That's okay. God is able. It's, it's, not, it's not tied to our ability. And God is able to make all grace abound. In Corinthians, Paul calls this, calls giving, this grace. It's, a, it's an act of grace. To make all grace abound. Watch, watch the absolutes here. All. Every. To make all grace abound. God's able to do that. So I don't see it. Well, that's because faith in God is con, uh, con, includes the unseen. If I only act on the basis of what I could see, it would, wouldn't require faith, would it? Faith is the substance of things for the evidence of things unseen. All grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things, all times, that's pretty comprehensive. He makes all grace abound, with the result that you'll have all sufficiency in all things at all times in every good work. It's abounding in every good work. And that's the outworking of it. That you're not, you're not hogtied by the devil. You're not uh, intimidated by him. You don't, you don't back away. And then here's this principle from Psalm 112 verse 9. As it's written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. It's the character of our God to give. And righteousness abounds in that. And so Paul promises them, verse 10, he who supplies seed to the sower, remember the picture of sowing and reaping, he's, he's not gotten away from that. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply, not only supply, and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. He ties here very clearly the, the discipline of principled purposeful giving to growing in grace. So much so that you can conclude, right, conclude that, that to the extent that I neglect this aspect of the gospel, I will, I will not grow in grace. My maturity will be stunted. Look at the fourth thing real quickly. The blessings that come to the giver. So what, so if, if say I've Go out on a limb and follow your example. Let's, suppose we close all the loopholes here so there's no way anybody can say that, that we're not giving us at 100%. It'd be interesting to see what happened if that, if that was the case. He promises you'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. Isn't that interesting? John Wesley, the, the uh, circuit rider, said, here was his principle you can, that is make all you can and save all you can so you can give all you can. It was pretty simple uh, practice that he followed. He didn't think there was anything wrong with, with, with making a lot of money. Make all you can. Save all you can so you can give away all you can. 
You'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Do you think, we've been giving uh, this past year and helping uh, the church at Dejun. Do you think they rejoice when they think of us? I believe they do. I believe they rejoice. When they think of the saints at Bethel and Owasso, Oklahoma, I think it redounds to produce thanksgiving to God. Thank you, Lord, for bringing that church into our... He says here, verse 12, for the ministry of this service, and it's interesting, uh, these, the words combined here, uh, one of them is the word diakonon. It's the, it's the word from which we get deacon. That's what being a deacon is. It's ministering, serving. Is not only supplying the needs of the saints. That's, that's we give so that others can hear the gospel. But it's also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. It not only meets needs, it causes them to see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus taught that in the Sermon on the Mount. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission. Watch this now. So it's an act of submission. Because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel. Folks, he ties giving here to a confession of the gospel. That to, to not endeavor to cultivate principled, purposeful giving is a practical denial of the gospel. Your confession of the gospel of Christ. And the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. He says here to the Corinthian, that church, your faithful giving is a manifestation of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Now he's talked a lot here. We could say a whole lot more. But, but get this. Having mentioned all of this What's been on Paul's mind the whole time? Giving? No. Verse 15 shows it's not. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Talking about giving triggers in Paul's mind, and it should in ours too, by the way, the reminder of the greatest gift of all, Jesus Christ given to us. He's already spoken to this so when he says this at, in chapter 9, verse 15, there's a context. I want you to see the context. Look at chapter 8, verses 8 to 15. By the way, I would encourage you, we don't have time here, I encourage you to read verses 1 to 7 where he describes how the folks in, uh, in another part gave in a way that surprised him. He said, they did not do what we, ought, what we thought they would do. They gave themselves first to God. Then they gave more than they were able. But he comes in verse uh, 8 in chapter eight of Second Corinthians. I say this not as a command, because he didn't want them to give under compulsion, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. I, he said, what I'm about to teach you is an opportunity for you to express the genuineness of your love. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. The exchange. The richness of Christ, he said, became poor among men to bring us grace so that in our poverty, blessed are the poor in spirit that was removed by the cross. We might become rich in the grace of God. Verse 10, in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. He's talking about the collection here. You showed an initial desire. So now finish doing it as well, so that your readiness in desiring may be matched by your completing of what you have. For if the readiness here, if the readiness of there is the, if the desire to give is there today, but you're struggling thinking, I don't have the ability, if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. God accepts your willing heart, your desiring heart. That may pray, God, I see in your word what I'm supposed to do. Very honestly, I don't know where I'm going to find a dollar in my budget. You know what? You come to God that honestly, he accepts that kind of heart. And I think you'll be surprised when you step out on faith and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to put a dollar in how he supplies the need, 
how he makes up for it, more than makes up for it. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened. That's not, that's not the point of giving. And it's never been discussed on giving the same thing. That's not it. It's everyone having the same commitment to give. That's, that's what drives the New Testament church. Mutual commitment. I don't mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need. Paul envisions a day when the church in Jerusalem has to take up an offering for the church in Corinth so that their abundance may supply your need that there may be fairness. As it's written, and this is a reference out of Exodus when they went out to gather manna, remember? Whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. God was able to supply the need. But they all gathered as a matter of principle. So the New Testament church practice of this is we all give as a matter of I'll challenge you here to, 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 to be an increasing blessing. Because you're going to look at a proposed budget that we're going to pass out uh, that's taken a 20-something thousand dollar cut this year. I will challenge you. Purpose to get a box of envelopes if you don't have them already. And purpose to give regularly, whether regularly is once a week or once a month or whatever. But put something in that envelope and turn it in so that our treasurer, and, the, and the, there's one or two people who, I'm not one of those, by the way. I don't, I don't have a, any idea as to what you give. As they count and put the offerings into the bank every week, could say to me, Pastor, do you know that 90-something percent of our families are giving? Now, folks, that would be very rare in, in churches. The typical churches, 20% of the members support 80% of the work. And that's true in tithes and offerings, and it's true in manpower. But this is not a typical church. It's not a typical church. You're not. You've been enlightened through the years. Wouldn't it be great, though, if that were to be the story? Let me close real quickly with five lessons I think we learned from this passage. First of all, there is no realistic expectation that you will abound in life if you live with a mentality that either gives begrudgingly or has fallen into the devil's snare based upon the lie that you cannot afford to give. There's no expectation that you will abound in life. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have an abundant life. But there are means to be employed. Second, giving under grace is a heart commitment that gladly gives to the cause of God. Let me ask you, when was the last time you thought about giving? Thinking spiritually. Seeking the face of God. Said, Lord, what would, you, what would you have us to do? It's a heart commitment. Third, our giving should be undertaken not based on our supposed ability, but on the ability of the very God who has taught us to give us, to give and warned us about the danger of robbing him. Learning to give according to God's ability, learning to give trusting in God that he, his ability is more than enough. And Karen and I have experienced that, by the way, and I can remember times in our, in our journey uh, when I thought, I don't know how we're going to give, where the money's going to come from. But as a principle, we give. And you know, we've never, we've never gone hungry. We've never gone uh, without, really, by, by this world standard. God's just faithful that way. I learned long ago that that he can do a lot more with what I give if I put it in his hands than I can if I keep it and do it myself. I had a fellow, a good friend of mine years ago, was an attorney, pretty, pretty sharp fellow, and uh, he was talking to me about, he said, my wife and I have our own way of giving. I said, really, what, what's that? He said, well, we don't give through the treasury of the church. He said, we, we, we may buy groceries for somebody if we see that they have a need, or we may do this, may do that. And he was feeling pretty good about it. And I said, you know, I said, there's a, there's a, the, the Bible has an expression for that. He said, really, what is it? I said, robbing God. We don't get to make it up, folks. 
The scripture's already given us the track we run on. Fourth thing, real quickly. Giving is a means of the giver being a blessing to others, but the greater blessing comes to the one who gives joyfully and generously. And see, I think sometimes we're unwittingly robbing ourselves of, the, of that joy and that blessing. And finally, giving should be undertaken by first remembering how our Savior gave himself for us. That even though he was rich, for our sakes he became poor. So that we could be rescued out of our poverty and delivered into the glory of his riches. We must remember Jesus Christ, as we do in all of life. Remember Jesus Christ. Not just when we have the Lord's Supper, but in every activity, particularly as Paul taught, when we contemplate our stewardship as stewards before God, who will one day give an account. It's required of a steward that he be found faithful. When I get there, here's what I want to hear. I, I'm, not, I'm not naive to think that, that the shouts of heaven will be, Bill Askell has arrived. I'm not naive about that. Here's what I want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. I hope you want to hear that too. Because of who he is, the giving God, we cannot help but respond to him by giving. Let's pray.